the healing wound. We, each and all of us, contain within us the entire history of the world. And just as our body records man's genealogy as far back as the fish and then some, so our soul encompasses everything that has ever existed in human souls. All gods and devils that have ever existed are within us as possibilities, as desires, as solutions. Herman Hess. All my professional life, I've been interested in the subject that has conspicuously failed to engage the great majority of psychologists, social scientists, and historians throughout the century, namely, the evolution of the unconscious psyche. This preoccupation reaches a peak for me, as it did for Jung, in the psychobiology of mental disorder. I shall focus now on the ways in which mental illness can afflict us when the two million year old human being within becomes frustrated, frightened, or discontented. In Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Jung records that when he entered the psychiatric profession, to the dismay of his tutors and fellow students, it was because he realized that psychiatry was the one branch of medicine which embraced the two passionate interests of his life, nature and the life of the spirit. Here alone, the two currents of my interests could flow together and in a united stream dig their own bed, he wrote. Here was the empirical field common to biological and spiritual facts, which I had everywhere sought and nowhere found. Here at last was a place where the collision of nature and spirit became a reality. However, when at the end of 1900, Jung started work as a junior psychiatrist at the Burgoldsi Hospital in Zurich under Eugene Bueller, the man who introduced the term schizophrenia into psychiatry, he discovered that his senior colleagues were less interested in the subjective meaning of their patient's distress than in classifying their symptoms, establishing a diagnosis, and compiling statistics. Since then, a non-awful lot has changed. Diagnosis continues to be the primary focus of psychiatric practice, and revised editions of the Diagnostics and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders are debated with a degree of hair-splitting pedantry worthy of medieval scholastics. There have been advances, it is true. More is known about the genetics and neurophysiology of the major psychoses. Antidepressants and tranquilizers have been discovered, which go some way to remove symptoms and relieve suffering. Many of the old mental hospitals have been closed down, though this achievement has proved a mixed blessing for both society and the patients. Chairs of psychiatry have been established in most universities. There has been steady progress in neuroscience, with important studies of the lateralization of function of the two cerebral hemispheres, the neural basis of memory and the emotional implications of the limbic system, the development of brain imaging techniques using computers to construct three-dimensional images from two-dimensional data, as in computerized tomography and magnetic resonance imaging, have led to a resurrection of Kraepel and Dementia Precox concept of schizophrenia and have advanced our understanding of cerebral changes and conditions such as Alzheimer's disease and Kiriskov's psychosis. Psychiatry is now, perhaps, a more respected profession than it was when you entered it at the beginning of the century, but not all the changes that have occurred would have met with his approval. What excited Jung about psychiatry was the intense personal engagement demanded of the doctor in the therapeutic relationship with the patient. Yet in recent years, the psychiatric interview has become less personal, clinical assessment of the patient being more dependent on the use of tests, questionnaires, inventories, and team meetings than on the traditional psychiatric examination conducted in the context of the doctor-patient relationship. Moreover, because of the advances in pharmacology and neurology, patients often tend to be treated as assemblies of enzymes and neuronal circuits while their personal, spiritual needs are neglected. The Cartesian split between body and mind has been echoed throughout this century in a split between psychiatry with its use of physical treatments and psychotherapy, the treatment of mind by mind. Mutual hostility and misunderstanding have resulted, with the psychotherapists creaming off the rich neurotics and leaving the poor psychotics to the psychiatrists. In general psychiatry, the overall emphasis continues to be organic, behavioral, and sociological, 
while the psychological and spiritual aspects of mental illness receive relatively little attention. Further advances in neurophysiology are expected to demonstrate an organic basis for the functional psychosis, schizophrenia and manic depressive psychosis. While this is of course to be welcomed, there is a grave danger that it will lead to the further neglect of the spiritual needs of patients and that psychiatry will become more and more reductionist, that is to say, that it will seek to explain all the joys and sorrows, the profound insights and extraordinary inspirations of human life in the language of genetics and chemistry. All this Jung would have regarded as a disaster for him both in his life and in his work with patients, psyche was primary and he was convinced that no discontinuity existed between the mentally healthy and the mentally ill. That what we see in psychiatric patients is an exaggeration of processes which exist in psychiatrists themselves, who of course consider themselves to be normal. In the 1970s, a crisis of confidence afflicted the profession, from which it has yet to recover. Many practitioners are still demoralized by the onslaught of the anti-psychiatry movement of the 1960s, which questioned the very existence of mental illness and stigmatized psychiatrists as repressive agents of the state. The primary reason for this loss of conviction is, I believe, a fundamental failure of vision. Psychiatrists generally lack a perspective wide enough to encompass the two realms of biology and psyche. Not only have psychiatrists too often failed to meet the spiritual needs of their patients, but they have also failed to establish the epistemological foundations of their discipline on the evolutionary subsoil out of which our species emerged. Intimidated by the anti-Darwinian prejudices of the behavioral scientists and fearing the contempt of their medical and surgical colleagues, psychiatrists have held on to their much hallowed medical model like shipwrecked mariners clinging to a raft. It all looks rather depressing, yet rescue is at hand. Although psychiatry has been in the doldrums, it could just be entering the most exciting episode in its history. The reason for this optimism is not just the evident advances in pharmacology and neuroscience, but the broader theoretical perspective being adopted by some of the brightest researchers working in the field. And to a psychiatrist steeped in the psychology of Jung, the most fascinating and promising element of these new developments is their endorsement of the central importance of the archetypal hypothesis. I believe that a massive paradigm shift is underway carrying us beyond the medical model with its inherent Cartesian split to an entirely new conceptual framework capable of defining the basic components of human nature, their evolutionary origins, and their essential developmental needs. Since the archetypal hypothesis gives equal weight to psyche and physical events, the new paradigm would serve to correct the materialistic and soulless biases of contemporary psychiatry. It also provides new insights into the genesis and, and meaning of psychopathological phenomena. Let me explain what I mean with a parable, which unlike most parables happens to be true. The Psychopathology of the Two Million Year Old At the London Zoo, there is a concrete mound surrounded by a moat known as Monkey Hill. It measures about 30 meters by 18. In 1925, the zoo authorities put two homogenous baboons on this pitiful hill and expected them to settle in a good-naturedly and entertain the public. They declined. It was to have been an all-male population, but with a degree of care that proved typical of the operation, six females were accidentally included. Vicious battles for dominance took place between the males, which continued for months, and before two years had elapsed, 44 of them were dead. But by then, a stable dominance hierarchy had been established, and an uneasy peace prevailed. However, the unfortunate creatures seemed unhappy, and in a wholly misguided attempt to cheer them up, the authorities put 30 more females on the island. Within a month, 15 of these had been torn to pieces by the resident males fighting to possess them. By 1930, only 39 males and 9 females survived, and that year, three males and four females were killed. What does this say about baboon psychology? Are there such vicious brutes that they are incapable of controlling their passions and living in peace with one another? How on earth 
has this species survived? To answer these questions, we must turn to the ethologists, those biologists who study animals living in their natural habitats, who have investigated the life of baboons in the sort of surroundings they evolved to live in. The ethologists tell us that, out of captivity, homogeneous baboons live in well-ordered social groups based on a stable dominance hierarchy. They respect each other's territories and seldom challenge heterosexual bonds once they have been formed. Clearly, the behavior of the baboons on Monkey Hill is grossly abnormal. What went wrong? Quite simply, the circumstances in which the zoo required them to live constituted a monstrous frustration for their basic archetypal expectations. The ethogram of the homogeneous baboon, that is to say the total archetypal endowment of the species, presupposes large areas of land on which to establish territories, win position in the social hierarchy, and, when successful in both these achievements, collect a harem of females. Instead of the 540 square meters afforded by Monkey Hill, a troop of 100 baboons would normally require a range of 50 square kilometers, 50,000 square meters, an area nearly 100 times as great. In normal circumstances, baboons develop intense group loyalties and are hostile to strangers from other troops. That the animals on Monkey Hill fought each other with such psychopathic savagery was due to the fact that they had been trapped and assembled from different wild troops and crowded together in a tiny area where they were more males and females and where they couldn't possibly keep out of each other's way. We must conclude, therefore, that the zoo environment in which this tragic population was placed constituted what I have called the frustration of archetypal intent. The result was gross and unmistakable psychopathology. This sad story is an allegory of what can happen to another creature that evolved to live in the wild open spaces of the East Africa savanna, Homo sapiens sapiens, when made to live in that urban habitat which Desmond Moore has called the human zoo. Directly comparable disasters to that suffered by the baboons in London Zoo occur in human communities forced to abandon their traditional way of life and live in circumstances alien to them. One such people was the Ik, a group of hunter-gatherers in Uganda who were excluded from their range of 40,000 square kilometers, placed in shack settlements and taught subsistence farming. They rapidly became demoralized, depressed, anxious, and ill, and they behaved with psychopathic indifference to the children and their spouses. Evidence such as this provides us with a model for psychopathology. Mental health depends upon the provision of physical and social environments capable of meeting the archetypal needs of the developing individual. Psychopathology can result when these needs are frustrated. This formulation gives rise to two fundamental questions. One, what are the archetypal needs of the developing individual? And two, what environments, physical and social, are capable of guaranteeing their fulfillment? These, it seems to me, are the two questions that psychology and psychiatry will have to address in the 21st century. The myth in terms of which the answers to these questions will have to be framed is that of Darwinian biology. For the Darwinian myth is the bedrock myth of our times, and no psychological explanation can hope to survive if it is incompatible with it. When I say this, I'm speaking of myth as an account of human origins that accords with the knowledge prevailing at the time of the myth's emergence into consciousness. Every living organism has an anatomical structure and a behavioral repertoire which is uniquely adapted to the environment in which it evolved, the environment of evolutionary adaptedness. This is the environment in which the individuals have a built-in expectation that they will live out their life cycle. Any alteration in the environment has consequences for the organism. Some changes may be compatible with survival, others may not, and changes which do not result in elimination of the species may nevertheless produce distortion in its typical modes of behaviors, which may lead ultimately to extinction. Human versatility, coupled with a sophisticated capacity for innovation, has resulted in dramatic transformations in the environments human beings now inhabit. These environments display an astonishing diversity 
in comparison with the stable characteristics of the African savanna where we evolved and lived out the greatest part of our existence as hunter-gatherers. Indeed, the speed at which environments have altered in recent centuries has far outstripped the pace at which natural selection can proceed in the time-honored Darwinian manner. These considerations present problems to any researcher wishing to establish precisely what the characteristics of the environment of human adaptness were actually like. Yet if we truly wish to understand what manner of creature we are, then the effort has to be made for the challenges provided by our primordial environment selected the archetypal propensities still present in human beings to this day. How can we proceed? How can we hope to establish the inventory of archetypal imperatives with which we have been equipped by evolution? One possibility is to study the lives of hunter-gatherer communities that have survived into the present century. People like the Ikung Bushmen of Botswana, so lovingly described by Lorenz Vanderpost. But how can we know that such people were when they were studied, as we were when we evolved? The answer is that we can't. If physical particles change their behavior when observed by physicists, then the behavior of hunter-gatherers is hardly likely to remain undisturbed when scrutinized by bespectacled anthropologists in baggy shorts. Moreover, we can't know how much modern ways had already begun to influence them before the anthropologists arrived on the scene. It is only an assumption that surviving hunter-gatherers were living closer to the original human state than populations practicing agriculture and animal husbandry, but it is, I think, a fair assumption. What other sources of information are there? Worldwide studies of cultural universals provide invaluable data when applied in conjunction with the law I propounded earlier, that whenever a phenomenon is found to be a characteristic of all human communities, irrespective of culture, race, or historical epoch, then it is an expression of an archetype of the collective unconscious. How can we know that these consistencies are due to archetypes and not to cultural diffusion? We can't. Both factors are involved. However, there will be a bias for those characteristics which are archetypally dependent to diffuse more readily than those which are not. When a pattern or characteristic such as maternal bonding, dominance, striving, or home building is found to satisfy three sets of criteria, it is likely to be archetypally based. These criteria are universality, continuity, and evolutionary stability. One, universality. The pattern in question is found in all known cultural groups. 2. Continuity The record of evolution shows no sharp break between human and other mammalian species with regard to the pattern concerned. Thus, attachment behavior between mothers and infants, between peers and between mature males and females can be traced backward from human beings through primates to their earliest mammalian origins. The major breakthrough of ethology has been to demonstrate that such patterns of behavior can be codified and their evolution studied in the same way as the evolution of anatomical structures such as bones, lungs, and brains. 3. Evolutionary Stability Patterns that are evolutionarily stable result in the same selective penalization and ultimate elimination of individuals who fail to manifest them. Since we are a supremely social animal, the most important characteristics of the evolutionary environment for us to define are the social characteristics. In what kinds of groups did we evolve? Astonishing though it is, remarkably few anthropologists have shown any interest in establishing the basic social parameters of the environment of human adaptness. One brave exception is Robin Fox, who has attempted to define the kind of society that is typical of hunter-gatherer communities. He refers to this society as the basic state. Where in time is the basic state to be found, asks Fox. The answer is straightforward, in the late Paleolithic, some 15 to 40,000 years ago. It is really that simple. We were fully formed in modern Homo sapiens sapiens. We had reached the top of the food chain. We were doing quite a bit better than our other carnivores. Then with frightening rapidity, it all began to go wrong. 
Fox argues that in the Upper Paleolithic, a balance existed between the organism, the social system, and the environment. Then two things happened to disturb this balance. The Ice Age, which increased the density of human populations by squeezing large numbers of peoples into Southwest Europe, the Middle East, and parts of Asia, and two, the discovery of agriculture and animal husbandry. The improved economy and increased numbers which these developments produced led in turn to the emergence of the characteristics typical of civilized societies, e.g. classes, castes, power elites, armies, empires, and the exploitation of subject peoples. Ever since then, these emergent properties, seized as their subject matter by the social scientists, have been on a collision course with the social needs of the Paleolithic hunter. What we call history, concludes Fox, is merely the most recent catalog of the products of this collision. Extrapolating from the extant ethnographic accounts of hunter-gatherer communities, Fox deduces that the organic groups in which our species lived for 99% of its existence consisted of about 40 to 50 individuals made up of approximately 6 to 10 adult males, about twice that number of childbearing females, and about 20 juveniles and infants. These were organic extended kinship groups, and they constitute what we might call the archetypal society of our kind. Such groups did not, of course, function in isolation. They came into frequent contact with other similar groups, hence the universal human rituals of greeting, visiting, feasting, making alliances, marrying, and warring. These compact extended kinship groups of 40 to 50 members knew one another intimately and shared the same values, rules, customs, and mores, their beliefs being sustained by myth, ritual, and religion. In all of them, the family was the central institution, whether polygamous, monogamous, or polyandrous. It is in order to live in such societies as this that nature has equipped us. This is why it is that being born into the contemporary world can come as a nasty shock to the system. The archetypal endowment with which each of us is born prepares us for the natural life cycle of our species in the natural world in which we evolved. A programmed sequences of stages, each mediated by a net of archetypal imperatives, seeks fulfillment in the development of characteristic patterns of personality and behavior. Each set of imperatives makes its own demands on the environment. Should the environment fail to meet them, then the evident result is the frustration of archetypal intent. For example, the infant mother archetypal system will achieve fulfillment only if activated by the presence and behavior of a maternal figure. The paternal archetypal system can be fulfilled only by the presence of a father figure, and the heterosexual archetypal system can achieve fulfillment only through the presence of a suitable mate. Should any of these figures be absent, then the archetypal system concerned will remain dormant in the unconscious and development will be arrested or follow an aberrant course. Put in these terms, the purpose of life is the fullest possible realization of the archetypal program. Individuation is the realization of this program as consciously as possible. We are now in a position to define a basic principle, a psychopathology. Psychopathology results when the environment fails, either partially or totally, to meet one or more basic archetypal needs in the developing individual. As far as I know, the first psychiatrist to propound this principle was John Bowlby, who stated that the further the rearing environment deviates from the environment of evolutionary adaptedness, the greater the likelihood of pathological development. If we are to understand the psychiatric disorders from which our contemporaries suffer, therefore, we have to consider in what ways Western society frustrates the needs of the two million year old, that is to say, the primordial man or woman within. Many possibilities immediately come to mind. The disruption of community-based kinship bonds as a result of migration, job mobility, experiments in town planning, and so on. The disruption of families through divorce and separation, together with the rapidly increasing incidence of single parent families. The lack of adequate provision for the secure and intimate care of children whose mothers go out to work. The loss of myths, rituals, and religion. The lack of contact with nature, the seasons, and the primordial environment. 
All these factors are potentially productive of stress, insecurity, and enemy, as well as skewed and distorted development. It seems likely that the various neurosis, psychopathies, drug dependencies, and occurrence of child and spouse abuse, to say nothing of the ever-rising crime statistics, are not unconnected with Western society's inability to satisfy our archetypal needs. However, I would not wish to imply that our society is an unmitigated disaster. In fact, the contemporary environment does not differ from the archetypal environment as radically as one might imagine when it comes to meeting the basic requirements of the self, the term Jung gave to the individual's total archetypal endowment. For example, the physical requirements of warmth, shelter, and nourishment are met in the West better than ever before in history. The social needs for parents, peers, and potential mates are also met in the majority of individuals. However, the number of people in whom these basic needs are not met is large and growing, as indeed is the psychiatric problem which they represent. A key factor in most psychiatric illness is stress. The probability is that the greater the gap between archetypal needs and environmental fulfillment of those needs, the greater the stress and the more incapacitating the illness. Although many people suffering from stress come to the attention of psychiatrists, many of them, perhaps the majority, do not, nor do they necessarily manifest the signs of psychiatric illness. When Jung gave up working with psychotic patients in hospitals in order to devote himself to his own research and to his private analytic practice, he noted that the people who came to consult with him were not on the whole, suffering from disorders susceptible to neat clinical diagnosis. Rather, they were suffering from the aimlessness and futility of their lives. He came to regard this as a malaise typical of the 20th century, which he called the general neurosis of our age. Jung had no hesitation in attributing this contemporary neurosis to the emergence of social institutions that alienated us from our archetypal nature. Secular urban life breeds disalliance with the unconscious, and, and disalliance with the unconscious is synonymous with loss of instinct and rootlessness. This insight was a long and respectable pedigree. In the 18th century, Dennis Diderot maintained that the benefits of civilization had been acquired at the cost of natural happiness. The civilized person of necessity remained an unhappy creature. The theme that to be Civilized, we had to renounce our basic instinct was taken up by Nietzsche and developed by Freud in Civilization and its Discontents, as well as by Jung in Modern Man in Search of a Soul. The great ethologist Conrad Lorenz compared our plight to that of a wild species that had been domesticated, like hens, cows, or hogs, living a wholly artificial existence that makes few demands of its instinctual equipment. While Desmond Morris, as we have seen, compared our lot to that of animals condemned to languish in a zoo of their own making. Our sense of bereavement for the lost habitat of our species might explain the bouts of nostalgia which take hold from time to time for primitive life, primitive people, and primitive art. For the life of Rousseau's noble savage, it is one motive that leads many of us into a fascination with anthropology but we should not allow it to encourage us to idealize the life of the hunter-gatherer, which, if not solitary, was often, as Thomas Hobbes described it, nasty, brutish, and short. Let me illustrate what I have been saying with an example from my own clinical experience, which shows how psychiatry and Jungian psychology can combine forces to promote insight, healing, and individuation in the face of severe frustration of archetypal intent. A pretty hopeless case. Jennifer was 21 and she was sent to me by her family doctor. A pretty hopeless case, I'm afraid, he said in his referral letter, but you may be able to do something for her. Although attractive, intelligent, and well educated, Jennifer had never had a boyfriend or a job. She lived with her father in a large London flat and kept house for him. Her mother had died from injuries in a car crash when Jennifer was six. As I was to discover at our first interview, she was a walking textbook of psychopathology. To list only the most obvious features of her condition, she was anxious, phobic, depressed, obsessive compulsive, and schizoid. I will take each of these in turn. Anxiety. 
Throughout our initial interviews, she remained tense and anxious, her skin pale and beaded with droplets of sweat. There was a fine tremor of her hands. Phobias. She had been a nervous child even before her mother died, afraid of the dark, water, loud noises, animals, strangers, and cripples. After her mother's death, she became frightened of all novel situations. Going to school was a terrifying experience, and by the time she was 10, she had developed a full-blown school phobia, with the result that her father took her out of school and arranged private tutoring for her at home. Although her childhood phobias had subsided by the time she consulted me, she was nevertheless suffering from claustrophobia. She could not use elevators or subway trains or sit comfortably in a room unless the door was open. For the first year of her treatment, the consulting room door had to be held open with the volume of Jung's collected works as a doorstop. Depression. The diagnosis of depression could be deduced from the fact that she expressed feelings of guilt and worthlessness and wished she could summon up the courage to kill herself. She was disinterested in food and was as thin as a rake. She also woke early every morning in a state of dark despair. Obsessive compulsive neuroses. That she was obsessive was abundantly clear. She spent her life cleaning and scrubbing and was terrified that she might in some way contaminate her father's food. She was also afflicted by intrusive thoughts and images over which she could exercise no control. The most common of these were thoughts of stabbing her father and of shrieking obscenities at him. Whenever she left her apartment to do some shopping or mail a letter, she spent over an hour checking that the gas taps were turned off. All switches in the off position, all appliances unplugged, all windows shut and locked, all doors bolted and barred. Schizoid personality. She was profoundly introverted and had withdrawn from virtually all contact with people rather than her father. She compensated for this social isolation with a rich fantasy life and wrote extraordinary romantic mythic tales, the composition of which was frequently accompanied by masturbation. At the end of our first session, I concluded that little analytic progress could be made until her symptoms had been reduced in intensity. I therefore prescribed an antidepressant and a tranquilizer and arranged to see her two hours a week for psychotherapy. The antidepressant I chose was anaphronel, a tricyclic which is particularly effective in treating depressions complicated by compulsive symptomatology. At that time the 5-HT uptake inhibitor floxetine was not available. When she came for her second session, she arrived four hours and a half late. What had happened was this, on her way to her first appointment with me, which as she later confessed, she anticipated with, with a dread amounting to terror. She had counted the number of paces it took her to walk from her father's apartment to my consulting room. It took 2,452 paces. On her way to her second visit, she knew she had to take exactly the same number of paces. She had arrived with half an hour to spare, but she had taken 2,498 paces. So she had to take a taxi home and start all over again. Next time she took 2,475 paces, so she had to go home once more. It took her four journeys to get it right. She arrived in a state of extreme agitation. The critical factors in her history were the early loss of her mother and the subsequent development of an exclusive relationship with her father a brilliantly successful but emotionally unstable lawyer who was undoubtedly devoted to her but was also tyrannically possessive and prone to unpredictable bouts of rage as if possessed by a powerful demon. Her obsessive rituals were in part acts of propitiation to avert his fury. At the same time, her fears of killing him were reaction formation against her own murderous feelings towards him. Her depression and sense of personal worthlessness arose because her father made her feel chronically inadequate and incapable of living up to the image of the daughter she believed he wanted her to be. Her fear of me and the ritual of counting the number of paces necessary to come to see me were the result of her transferring the father Imago onto me as well as the archetype of the shaman, the medicine man, the healer. The counting ritual had to be gone through as a means of propitiating me and guaranteeing that I would not become incensed with her in the course of her session. The door had to be left open for the same reason. It would guarantee a hurried exit should the demon become operative in me. For her subsequent appointments, I gave her an hour late in the day 
so that she would be able to sort out her counting rituals and get to my door in time. She got quite good at this after a while, though she often had to hop the last 20 or 30 paces, much to the entertainment of passers-by. After she had been on anaphenol three weeks, her depression began to lift, and a week later she was able to come to see me by taxi, thus avoiding the need to count her steps. At this point, a conventional psychiatrist would probably have reduced her sessions to once a month. I, on the other hand, increased them to three times a week. With the subsistence of her more incapacitating symptoms, the analysis could begin. What archetypal imperatives have been frustrated in Jennifer's personal history? The age of six is far too early for any child to lose its mother with impunity. This tragedy not only deprived Jennifer of the rich nourishment of a mother's love, but of a female role model to initiate her into womanhood. It also left her with an unresolved electric complex and an inability to relate to any man except her father. The absence of an extended family network further emphasized her exclusive dependency on her father. She had a grandmother surviving in Southern Ireland, an aunt in Northern Scotland, a cousin in Los Angeles, and another in Perth, Western Australia. She had no friends or acquaintances in London. There was, you could say without any fear of contradiction, a lack of kinship libido and community feeling in her life. The absence of siblings and peers during childhood had contributed to her schizoid withdrawal, having deprived her of the opportunity which both peer bonding and play bring to the development of emotional spontaneity of the skills of social intercourse. Moreover, she had no contact with animals. Her father would not allow them on account of the mess. With nature, she seldom left London, or with religion, her father was an atheist. Her only pleasures were her fantasy life and music. She was a good pianist, and her father had a large record collection. As a result of these frustrations of an archetypal intent, her development had gone seriously awry. The loss of her mother not only predisposed her to depression and impaired her development of what Eric Erickson calls identity formation, but effectively imprisoned her in the father-daughter relationship. Why should her symptoms have become particularly bad as she entered her 20s? Well, this is the archetypal stage of courtship, marriage, achieving social status, and in the modern world, getting a job. None of these had she achieved or even attempted, but the pressure of the self toward realization of all this potential was increasing, and something had to give. The result was the emergence of this formidable array of symptomatology. The Psychobiology of Symptoms What can psychobiology tell us about the nature of her symptoms? How can we relate them to the two million year old woman in Jennifer's psyche? Let us turn to each symptom again. Anxiety In the course of the present century, the idea has been current that anxiety is neurotic and that the well-adjusted person would never suffer from it. This of course is nonsense. Anxiety is a natural and universal experience which human beings share with all mammals. Since it is ubiquitous, it must serve a biological function, otherwise it would not have evolved or at least not have persisted. What then are the biological functions of anxiety? Anxiety is a form of vigilance. To survive in this dangerous world, an organism has to be alert to environmental changes so that it can be prepared to meet whatever emergencies may arise. Pavlov considered this vigilance to be a reflex and he called it the what is it reflex. Vigilance or what is it reflex does not necessarily give rise to anxiety. Vigilance is merely alertness to the possibility of change in the environment. Vigilance shifts into anxiety when a possible threat or danger has been perceived. The actual experience of anxiety is directly associated with physiological changes that prepare the body for violent action. The heart rate increases, the blood pressure goes up, adrenaline is secreted, energy stores are mobilized in the liver released into the bloodstream. Blood is redistributed from the internal organs so as to carry oxygen and energy to the muscles and the brain. At the same time, the thyroid gland is stimulated to increase the efficiency of body metabolism. Labored breathing occurs and the large muscles used in violent action are brought to peak efficiency. Red corpuscles are liberated from the spleen to increase the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Small muscles at the base of the hair follicles contract, causing goose pimples to form and the hair to stand on end. 
the sweat glands secrete profusely, and so on. All these changes are caused by activation of the sympathetic nervous system and have the effect of preparing the organism to fight like a demon or run like hell, the fight or flight response. In the environment of evolutionary adaptedness, therefore, vigilance and anxiety are crucial to survival. In the modern world, however, they can seem exaggerated or inappropriate. When anxiety is exaggerated, inappropriate and persistent, it becomes a symptom of interest to psychiatrists and to the pharmaceutical industry and its shareholders. A crucial question for psychopathology is why a natural psychophysiological response, anxiety, should become exaggerated into a persistent and inappropriate neurotic state, anxiety neurosis. There have been a number of theoretical approaches to this question. The most influential of these has been the Freudian approach, which sees neuroses as a direct result of traumatic experience in early childhood. This was certainly true in Jennifer's case. Life cruelly deprived her of the mother long before she was able to survive happily without one, and life failed to provide her with a peers at the time when she needed them. The consequences of separation from or loss of mother have received particular attention from the British analysts Bowlby, Fairbairn, and Winnicott. Bowlby in particular was careful to base his work in ethology, and for this reason his formulations will guide us for many years to come. Throughout Bowlby's work, one fundamental notion persists, the idea that non-correspondence between the developing needs of the child and conditions prevailing in its environment contributes to its susceptibility to neurosis. I once gave a paper in London comparing Bowlby's approach with Jung's when Bowlby was present. In discussion afterwards, he agreed that he accepted the Jungian formulation that neurosis is liable to occur when the archetypal program unfolding in the psyche of the child is not met by the correspondingly appropriate figures and situations in the environment. Essentially, he was in agreement with the proposition that neurotic anxiety results from the frustration of archetypal intent. And this, in my view, rather than any specific trauma suffered in infancy, is the cause of psychiatric disturbance in childhood, adolescence, and later life. Phobia. Psychiatry makes a distinction between free-floating anxiety, which may be evoked by a variety of different situations, and phobic anxiety, which is specific to one situation, such as confined spaces, open spaces with no covers, snakes, spiders, predatory beasts, strangers, heights, and so on. It is of the utmost interest for our theme that when the various phobias suffered by modern men and women are examined in detail, there is nothing modern about them. They are all exaggerated fears of objects, animals, or situations that were potentially life-threatening in the environment of evolutionary adaptedness. This vital point is invariably overlooked in textbooks of psychiatry, probably because it is not apparent until you think about it. Conditions that give rise to flight, withdrawal, or other demonstrations of fear, both in animals and in humans, are not necessarily dangerous in themselves. But when you consider them carefully, it becomes clear that they are related, if only indirectly, to situations that actually are a hazard to life or limb. As Bowlby put it, in a wide array of animal species, including man, a principal condition that elicits alarm and retreat is mere strangeness. Others are noise and objects that rapidly expand or approach, and also for animals of some species, though not for others, darkness. Yet another is isolation. Now it is obvious that none of these stimulus situations is in itself dangerous, yet when looked at through evolutionary spectacles, their role in promoting survival is not difficult to see. Noise, strangeness, rapid approach, isolation, and for many species, darkness too, all are conditions statistically associated with an increased risk of danger. The tendency to react with fear to such common stimulus situation is due to genetic biases that possess survival value in the sense that they prepare individuals to meet real dangers. The existence of these biases would explain how it is that in modern civilized environments, fear can be aroused in a variety of situations that are not, in fact, dangerous. Thus, to show panic, fear, in response to finding oneself in an enclosed space like an elevator or a subway train, to react with terror in response to the perception of height, 
or the realization that one is entirely alone in the dark may seem absurd to a normally adjusted person, but viewed from a biological standpoint, these reactions are understandable as manifestations of ancient response patterns. What the individual is responding to are the natural cues or sign stimuli commonly associated with danger in the environment of evolutionary adaptedness. Often these cues do not signify any menace, but the fact remains that they could. Therefore, it is not altogether inappropriate for the individual to respond to them with wariness or fear, if only on the principle that it is better to be safe than sorry. Now the form of phobia selected by the patient is usually full of symbolic meaning. You will recall that Jennifer's phobia was of confined spaces. Claustrophobia is evidently an exaggeration of the natural response shared by all mammals to being trapped in an enclosed area and deprived of all means of escape. It is not surprising, therefore, that it is found in clinical practice that claustrophobia commonly occurs in people who experience home as suffocating and parents as oppressors, whereas agoraphobics experience the outside world as threatening and feel secure only at home. For claustrophobics, it is home that arouses anxiety, and there is a desire to flee from the threatening enclosure that home represents. Characteristically, the claustrophobic flees not only from physical enclosure but imprisonment in social roles from which there is no means of escape. As a result, commitments such as marriage and a job are far too dangerous to be risked. This was precisely Jennifer's condition when she entered analysis. Depression People who are prone to depression are typically those who have experienced some form of parental loss, rejection, or neglect in childhood. Depressive illness tends to recur when the individual suffers some new frustration of his or her archetypal needs. This new frustration is experienced as a recapitulation of the original depressing or frustrating experience of childhood. Analysis reveals the nature of her original frustrating experience and points to the kind of analytic work that needs to be done during the rest of therapy. As with anxiety, depression is also a natural and universal experience human beings share with all mammalian species. It thus must be a biological condition contributing to survival. What can its function be? On the whole, it appears that depression is an adaptive reaction to loss or deprivation. It occurs, for example, in all young mammals when they are forcibly separated from their mothers, and in all individuals living in hierarchically organized groups when deprived of rank in the social hierarchy. How can this contribute to survival? Having lost its mother, and after the initial cries of protest are over, the depressed infant lies still, silent and waiting, conserves body energy and avoids the attention of predators. By this strategy, the animal can survive until reunited with its mother or adopted by a surrogate parent moved by its depressed state. Similarly, a depressive reaction to loss of status enables the demoted individual to adapt passively to the lower rank, thus avoiding further attack from the more powerful individual who has displaced him or her. This in turn contributes to peace and social cohesion. Depression therefore is linked with the ubiquitous mammalian tactic of submission, while its opposite mania is linked with the tactic of dominance. Manic depression is thus inextricably tied into the dominant submission archetypal system and its linked systems, aggression and defense. In Jennifer's case, her depression was linked to her submission to her father's dominance and to her perceived inability to make her way in the world. Obsessive Compulsive Neurosis Obsessive compulsive behavior is a byproduct of the need to control potentially dangerous events, objects, peoples, thoughts, feelings, impulses, or situations. It is commonly associated with powerful emotions, particularly fear, anger, and guilt. Guilt, like anxiety, depression, and anger, is an emotion to which all social animals are prone. It evolved as an adaptive device designed to maintain social order and homogeneity. Like anxiety, it can be exaggerated and become the symptom of neurotic illness. This occurs most markedly in the case of obsessive neurosis. Exaggerated guilt and obsessive compulsive behavior are more likely to occur in homes ruled by the principle of logos and least likely to those ruled by eros. Guilt is evoked by thoughts 
feelings, and actions that offend against whatever moral authority the individuals brought up to respect, and which became internalized in the form of the moral complex, that inner patriarch or matriarch which Freud called the superego. Guilt and obsessive compulsive neuroses are more apparent in people who have internalized their authorities out of fear rather than out of love. Typically, those who have been brought up through fear bear a grudge against authority and wish to defy it, however much they may overtly subscribe to its values. As a result, a conflict rages in them between the desire for defiance and the need to submit. Locked in this conflict, the patient feels compelled to think or do things that are foreign to his or her conscious personality. In this manner, Jennifer was obsessed by thoughts of murdering her father and felt compelled to engage in all manner of rituals to prevent these thoughts from achieving their objective. Moreover, her condition largely owed its origins and its severity to the fact that her father was himself an obsessive compulsive personality. Because of constant terror that things may get out of hand, obsessive individuals are driven by a compulsion to control events and people. What is intolerable is anything spontaneous, fortuitous, or unpredictable. In his book, Anxiety and Neurosis, Charles Rycroft describes the attitude obsessives adopt to their own emotional life and that of people around them as reminiscent of a colonial governor ruling an alien and potentially rebellious population, or like an animal in possession of a territory over which it has established absolute power and mastery. They treat all spontaneous tendencies, all uncensored emotions, as if they were dangerous invaders. That is to say, they go on the attack either to expel intruders or to force them into submission. When the intruder is an alienated part of the self, the attack is recognized by analysts as repression. This formulation helps us to understand why it is that the shadow is particularly threatening to the obsessive person. The shadow has to be ruthlessly beaten into submission for fear that it might otherwise get out of control. This single fact presented me with the most formidable obstacle to a successful outcome in Jennifer's case. I do not believe I could have succeeded were it not for the pharmacological assistance provided by Anafrenel. Schizoid Personality It is often asserted that schizoid personalities do not become depressed, they are too detached. It is thought to be depressive. In fact, I have known a number of schizoid people who suffered from depression, and I take this when it happens as a positive prognostic sign that they are not so detached from reality as to be unconcerned about what is happening in their lives. This was certainly true in Jennifer's case. <sighs> Why do people become schizoid? In part, it is a response to disappointment of basic social needs but it can also be related to an innate introversion. Schizoid people typically had parents who were either absent for critical periods in their childhood or showed little regard for them as people in their own right. Such parents seem to overlook the fact that their children have thoughts and feelings of their own. They tend to treat them like dolls to be picked up, put down, packed off to school, or put away in the nursery, as seems most convenient. As a consequence, the child grows up distrusting all human relationships, feeling that its own needs and wishes will never be considered. In these circumstances, the most practical strategy is to opt out from people and retreat into oneself. The schizoid withdrawal from social life into a self-absorbed introversion is thus an appropriate response to repeated frustrations of those archetypal imperatives concerned with social development. This is what had happened to Jennifer. Shut up in an isolated citadel of the self, what happens to the archetypes of the collective unconscious? They may remain latent as unconscious potential, they may manifest in dreams and fantasies, or they may be experienced as threatening symptoms, things to be feared and if possible controlled, denied, or repressed. The latter course is the most dangerous as the repressed archetypal components are projected out onto figures in the environment in that way lies madness. At the beginning of her treatment, I was alarmed to discover that this had begun to occur in Jennifer, and it got into the transference. She reacted with paranoid sensitivity to my most innocent remarks, and there were occasions when she couldn't bear for me to look at her. Just as her claustrophobia prevented her from traveling to subway trains, 
so her paranoid sensitivity prevented her from riding on buses. She felt people were looking at her, commenting on her, and laughing at her. This exquisite self-consciousness is common to both schizoid personalities and schizophrenics. The fear of being looked at or stared at is the fear of having one's defenses penetrated, of being evicted from one's inner citadel. The eye is one of the most common features of schizotypal art. How are we to relate this phenomenon to our evolutionary heritage? Ethological studies have shown that staring and visual attention are very important to all social mammals. The higher a dominant animal ranks in the social hierarchy, the more the less dependent members of the society stare and attend to that one's needs. The dominant animal accepts such attention as rightfully due and is unperturbed by it. But if a subdominant animal is stared at by a dominant animal, the subdominant experiences it as frightening and intimidating. A dominant animal's stare is usually one of reproof and is aggressive in intent. The same is true in human communities. Kings, queens, presidents, prime ministers, television personalities, and pop stars all thrive on being looked at and attended to. Their self-esteem usually glories in such scrutiny. But a person of low status who is stared at, or one with feelings of low self-esteem, experiences it as threatening and a cause for alarm. For this reason, for a schizoid or a schizophrenic patient whose self-esteem is almost invariably impaired, dislike of being stared at is a normal mammalian response. A further archetypal component of staring is that of the predator. Predators stare unblinkingly and with intense fascination at their prey. Men waiting in ambush to attack potential victims behave in precisely the same way. Staring is a primordial feature of the enemy archetype. There are, therefore, biological analogies for anxiety about being looked at, being distinctive, or drawing attention to oneself. Camouflage is, after all, a defense mechanism apparent throughout nature. Vulnerable individuals defend themselves from attack by merging with the landscape and rendering themselves inconspicuous. This is at the bottom of all fears of being different. The schizoid phenomenon is one that we can readily understand because there is a sense in which any reasonably well-educated person in our culture also be said to be schizoid. The scientific disciplines that have emerged in the last 300 years teach us to separate ourselves from the outer world in order to look at it objectively and dispassionately. Indeed, the philosopher whose insights made the scientific method possible was himself a schizoid personality. Rene Descartes taught us to depersonalize the world and to separate our minds from our bodies. Before that, we probably tended to personalize the world of things and to read human intentions into all existence, as children continue to do to this day, until adults educate it out of them. In dealing with schizoid patients, the crucial questions are 1. How far has treatment into the citadel proceeded? And 2. To what extent has the ego succeeded in both sustaining some kind of relationship to our reality and at the same time entering into a creative relationship with the self. Fortunately, in Jennifer's case, she had not retreated so far as to preclude the forming of a therapeutic relationship. Moreover, her rich fantasy life meant that she was in creative relationship with the self, and I was able to mobilize this in the service of the analysis. It was not an easy ride. No sooner did she begin to trust me then she entered a phase of intense, anxious attachment to me. She often experienced difficulty in leaving at the end of sessions. I had to cope with suicide threats on weekends and holidays, and she concocted a series of rituals to go through each time she left my consulting room to ensure that I would still be well disposed to her when she returned on the next occasion. What was my duty as her doctorate analyst? Essentially, I conceived these to be as follows. One to render her symptoms less incapacitating. Two, to become the good father who wanted her to grow up and take on the tasks of adulthood. Three, to mobilize the individuation principle in the self. And four, to encourage her to leave home, get a job, become independent of her father, and begin to stand on her own feet. Finally, when these goals had been achieved, I regarded it as essential to refer her to a woman analyst who could help her to affirm her identity with the feminine principle and to experience herself as a woman. 
And was this ambitious therapeutic program achieved? To a greater or lesser extent, I am relieved to report it was. It was three years before she was able to leave her father, set up house on her own, and find a job as a receptionist in a doctor's clinic. A year later, I referred her to a woman analyst, and a year after that, she married a publisher. All that was a long time ago, but when I contacted her recently to request her permission to use her history, suitably disguised, she seemed well and happy. She has two adolescent children, works for an animal welfare agency, is a vegetarian and a Buddhist, and she is still with the man she married 15 years ago. No mean feat these days. In the name of clinical honesty, I must declare, however, that the successful outcome of this case depended as much on the use of anaphrenol as on the analysis. Obsessive compulsive patients are the hardest to analyze, especially when they are depressed or have a schizoid personality. Without pharmacological help, the analysis might have been stillborn, because we would probably have remained bogged down in her appalling symptoms. But if, on the other hand, I had merely played the role of a psychiatrist and contented myself with the removing of her symptoms, she would in all probability still be stuck at home with her aged father, and her individuation would be no further along. I have discussed this case at such length because it illustrates how the frustration of archetypal intentions can result in severe psychopathology and how the use of conventional psychiatric assessment and treatment may be combined with Jungian analysis to facilitate healing. The Five Laws of Psychodynamics We are now in a position to propose five laws of psychodynamics. First law. Whenever a phenomenon is found to be characteristic of all human communities, irrespective of culture, race, or historical epoch, then it is an expression of an archetype of the collective unconscious. Second law. Archetypes possess an inherent dynamic whose goal is to actualize themselves in both psyche and behavior. Third law. Mental health results from the fulfillment of archetypal goals. Fourth law. Psychopathology results from the frustration of archetypal goals. Fifth law. Psychiatric symptoms are persistent exaggerations of natural psychophysiological responses. These laws, which appear to us to be explicitly about human psychic functioning, are in fact mere applications to the psyche of laws whose operation is apparent throughout nature. Thus, the acorn will become the best oak tree it can, given the nature of the soil, the condition of the climate, the proximity and height of the surrounding trees, and so on. Deficiencies in any of these environmental conditions will result in stunting or susceptibility to disease, such as dieback, the mystery disease afflicting many oak trees in Britain at the present time. It is important to recognize that the frustration of archetypal intent can occur at any stage of the life cycle, and not only in childhood as Freud supposed. For this reason, Jung did not consider that psychopathology is invariably related to early traumatic childhood experience. Unlike Freud, Jung recognized that development proceeds throughout the whole life cycle, and that every stage has its own archetypal goals. The truth of this view has been confirmed empirically. George Brown and his colleagues have shown from studies based on their social research unit in London that individuals who can depend on the physical and verbal expression of attachment from an intimate companion enjoy a vital social asset, protecting them from depression and neurotic distress. They found that it was not at all uncommon for anxiety and depression to be caused not by childhood deprivation, but by a major life event which revealed that current personal relationships were unsupportive and uncaring. The fifth law, psychiatric symptoms are persistent exaggerations of natural psychophysiological responses was not only proposed by Freud and by Jung, but has been reaffirmed by the contemporary ethopsychiatrists. For example, Brent Winogret at the Sanford University Medical Center in California sees all psychopathological syndromes, whether psychotic, neurotic, or psychopathic, as statistically abnormal manifestations of innate response strategies shared by all individuals, whether they are mentally healthy or ill. As we saw earlier by innate response strategies, Winograd means the same as archetypes. 
Winograd's understanding of psychopathology is in complete agreement with Jung's position. As Jung wrote, We have known for a long time that the mentality of the neurotic is basically normal, though marred on the surface by exaggeration and disproportion. In other words, the neurotic is normal apart from certain anomalies. Jung maintained that the same could be said of the psychotic. Nothing produced by the human mind is completely outside our psychic range. Even the craziest idea must derive from something within the human mind, from some hidden root or premise. Without definitive evidence to the contrary, we cannot suppose certain minds to contain elements that our other minds do not contain at all. He concluded that insanity is merely the manifestation of a hidden yet generally existent condition. It is as if the dreaming mode persists in the waking brain, and for this reason the psychotic lives in closer relationship with the two million year old through a form of participation mystique. In psychosis, the number one personality ceases to be effective, and the number two takes over. Adaptation to the outer world is consequently defective. The Crucial Archetypal Systems Of the archetypal systems studied by the new breed of biologically oriented psychiatrists, the ethopsychiatrists, that concerned with caregiving has certainly received the closest attention. But one other system is beginning to achieve almost as much importance that concerned with competition. In a major work, Human Nature and Suffering, Paul Gilbert describes four distinct biosocial goals which he sees as fundamental. These are caregiving and care receiving, the archetypal system studied by Bowlby, and competing and cooperating, the archetypal systems at heart of Alfred Adler's work. Success in pursuit of these goals, according to Gilbert, results in both psychiatric health and genetic fitness, that is to say, the individual is more likely to pass his or her genes on to the next generation. Failure in pursuit of these goals, on the other hand, results in psychopathology. Care or provision is a cornerstone of human culture, and there is a good biological reason for this. Not only is a caring community better able to succeed in struggle for survival, but in the modern biological view, our genes see to it that we care for others who carry similar genes to our own. What matters in nature? is not primarily that individuals should reproduce themselves, but that their genes should survive. The most efficient way of achieving this is through progeny, but it can also be achieved by assisting kin who inevitably carry a proportion of the same genes. This is the post-Darwinian idea that natural selection operates not on individuals but on genes. The notion of inclusive reproductive fitness has come to replace Darwin's theory of sexual reproductive fitness. Thus, behaviors like altruism has been selected and plays an important part in the life of all social mammals. Why should this be? Why should I put my life at risk to protect my children, siblings, or cousins? The answer is that as far as nature is concerned, the survival of one's genes is every bit as important as, if not more important than, the survival of one's clan. Altruism, nurturance, and caregiving are thus genetically transmitted response strategies, to use the socio-biological term adopted by Winograd, which function at the core of human nature. Yet as society, the most telling accusation that can be made is that we are not very good at caring for each other, and our failure in this regard lies at the root of so many of our human miseries. The great lack in urban life, as we saw in Jennifer's case, is the lack of kinship libido Perhaps those of us who are drawn into the caring professions are driven by a collective anatiodromia, a compensatory attempt to make good what has been lost. The cold, classical Freudian approach failed to provide this. Gilbert suggests the reason why co itself psychology has been so popular and has had such a powerful influence on psychoanalytic theory is because it has provided a therapeutic rationale for therapists to be warm, accepting, and involved with their patients, something that Jung was advocating long ago. However, as Friedrich Nietzsche and Alfred Adler observed, we are not just nurturant, caring creatures who are aggressive, acquisitive, and status-hungry as well. This description applies not only to the emotionally frustrated, it is true of humanity as a whole. There are, it seems, two types of hunter-gatherer societies. Type 1, 
The simplest type of society is based on an economy of immediate consumption, and there are no obvious hierarchies, though the personal dominance of some individuals is evident. Type 2. The most sophisticated type of society is one in which surpluses of food and resources are accumulated, and these societies show the beginning of clear social rank. In all primate societies, sexual selection has ensured that males of high rank reproduce more than males of low rank. The resulting inequality, or social asymmetry, is maintained by force, not by the police, but by the occurrence of tournaments known by the ethologist as ritual agonistic behavior. Success in status conflict dominance is associated, as we have already seen, with elation, mania, and failure, submission, with despondency, depression. Thus, like all other primates, and all their animals for that matter, we are both affiliative and hostile. We want both attachments and status. We are both Freudian and Adlerian, or in Aristotle's terms, both hedonic and political. This basic dichotomy has been studied by Michael Chance of the Social Systems Institute of Birmingham. Chance describes two different and antithetical types of social systems operating in primate societies, including our own, which he designates the hedonic and agonic modes respectively. The hedonic mode is characteristic of affiliative groups in which the members offer mutual support. The agonic mode is characterized of hierarchically organized groups where members are concerned with their status and with warding off threats to it. In the agonic mode, tension, arousal, and stress are at a high level. In the hedonic mode, things are infinitely more relaxed. There is an evident link here with the mobilized and relaxed states described by Anthony Wallace, and which I have described as typical of human populations in times of war and in times of peace. The distinctions chance makes between two fundamental social modes are in line with similar distinctions occurring in the history of ideas. There are parallels, for example, with Freud's Eros and Thanatos instincts. Eros, the life instinct, expresses itself in the act of bonding, integrating, and creating. Thanatos, the death instinct, in dissolving, disintegrating, and destroying. Freud hardly used the term Thanatos in his published work, preferring the term destructive instinct, and occasionally, instinct to mastery or will to power. Moreover, in Freud's theoretical division of the instincts, we find echoes of the antithesis made by Empedocles between the two great opposing but equal principles presiding over the perpetual fluxes of all existence, which he called love and strife. Freud acknowledged this connection. The two fundamental principles of Empedocles, love and strife, are, wrote Freud, both in name and function, the same as our own two primal instincts. Eros and destructiveness, or Thanatos. Many other similar parallels could be drawn, as for example, the valuable distinction made by Gordon Rattray Taylor between egalitarian, affiliative, matrist societies and authoritarian, aggressive, patriot societies, the distinction made by classical Chinese philosophy between yin and yang, Jung's distinctions between Eros and Logos principles, and so on. In short, the evidence points to the existence of two great archetypal systems, one that concerned with attachment, affiliation, caregiving, care receiving, and altruism, and two that concerned with rank, status, discipline, law and order, territory, and possessions. These are, it seems, the basic archetypal patterns on which health and sickness depend. Both function healthily when evoked in appropriate circumstances. But either can rise to pathology when their goals are frustrated or when they are inappropriately activated. For example, when relations between husbands and wives or between parents and children go wrong, it is because they have shifted from the hedonic to the agonic mode. Expressions of love, nurturance, and support give way to expressions of anger, disappointment, and resentment. Status attacking and effort to dominate and control take the place of caresses and loving styles of relating. When a decisive and lasting shift from the hedonic to the agonic mode occurs within either the family structure or the personality structure of the individual members of the family, the way it is proposed for physical abuse, sexual abuse, substance abuse, and identity abuse. All of these are likely to coincide with the rising incidence of anxiety, emotional stress, depression, 
alcoholism, crime and suicide to help inflate the psychiatric statistics. These disasters are examples of individuation being shunted onto the wrong track. The two social archetypal systems, corresponding to Aristotle's hedonic and political levels of life, should not so dazzle us with their significance that we overlook his third level, which was of such crucial importance to Jung, the contemplative life. For this represents the activity of a third great archetypal imperative, that concern with the perception of meaning. As Jung said at the end of his BBC interview with John Freeman, human beings cannot live a meaningless life. Healing. As we saw in the case of Jennifer, the approaches of conventional psychiatry and Jungian psychology can assist one another in achieving a satisfactory therapeutic outcome, especially when the illness is understood as having a biological basis and as representing a frustrated attempt at individuation. Jung has often been criticized for his failure to make a clear distinction between normal and abnormal psychology and for not developing a coherent theory of neuroses, psychosis, or psychopathy. This was in part a revolt against Freud's reductionism but also, more significantly, a reflection of his belief that mental health and mental illness are both expressions of the soul's quest for growth and meaning. Jung sought to transcend the distinction so beloved of clinical psychiatrists by taking the psyche as primary and developing techniques to further its quest for individuation. Psychiatric diagnoses then became of less critical importance. Hidden in the neurosis is a bit of still undeveloped personality, wrote Jung, a precious fragment of the psyche lacking, which a man is condemned to resignation, bitterness, and everything else that is hostile to life. He goes on, a neurosis is by no means merely a negative thing, it is also something positive. In other works, the illness is symptomatic of the psyche's effort to heal itself. It is the healing wound. For psychotherapy to have a successful outcome, it is essential for the therapeutic relationship to function in the hedonic mode. Therapy is that stress the importance of negative transference, rage, aggression, jealousy, and hostility and which give little space for expressions of affection, nurturance, and attachment are, in my view, destructive. In good therapy, the agonistic must be contained within the hedonic rather than the other way around. The course of healing proceeds autonomously. To succeed, the healer, whether psychiatrist, psychotherapist, shaman, or medicine man, must act in such a way as to flow with the healing intention of the self. A man is ill, wrote Jung, but the illness is nature's attempt to heal him. And again, in neurosis is hidden one's worst enemy and best friend. The neurosis also acts as a noxious stimulus which goes the individual to seek help. When Jung observed of a patient, thank God he became neurotic. He meant that thanks to the neurosis, the patient had been shaken out of his apathy and his resistance to change. Neurosis, and certain forms of psychosis can, therefore, be understood as the consequences of vigilance and as extensions of anxiety, fear, and paranoia. Biological functions that allure us to danger or potential injury and motivate us to circumvent it. Our contemporary mental illnesses are not only persistent exaggerations of ancient responses, they also represent a desperate attempt on the part of the two million year old human being to adjust to the contemporary world.